Ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to begin by expressing my very deep appreciation for this invitation to speak here this afternoon. I must confess, however, that I'm a little puzzled by it because my specialization is the history of ancient India, and I'm really not so sure that I know anything at all about conflict resolution and the development problems of the world today. But for what it's worth, I'm going to say my say. Thank you for the introduction, and I hope somewhere along the line, what I have to say links up with what is being discussed here. I would like to argue that historians today need to recognize that they have a role in society as public intellectuals. This disallows historians from retiring comfortably to an ivory tower. Instead, it requires them to be aware of what is being claimed as history. Some of those that make this claim require a history not as a curiosity about the past or an explanation of the past, but to bolster up their political ideologies. Where this is fraudulent history, it has to be countered by historians with theories based on a critical inquiry into sources and arguments foundational to the discipline of history. In a sense, therefore, historians have to protect their discipline. This is normally done by writing reliable history using acknowledged methodologies. In addition now, there is a need for acquainting the public with what we mean by historical writing. In explaining how it can be differentiated from popular fantasies about the past, we have to provide a socio-economic context of the event and to analyze the context. Such fantasies are frequently related to varieties of nationalisms, often tied to religion, language, ethnicity, and supportive of particular dominant groups. These, in turn, are used to nurture the politics of identity, a type of politics that is very common and frequent today. It is also tied to nationalism, as I said, and nationalism was associated with constructing a new kind of community. It established its identity through what has been held out as a shared past reflected in a shared history and culture. Eric Hobsbawm speaks of the relationship of history to nationalism and as comparable to what the poppy means to the heroin addict. The interdependence is very close and history is a major source of identity. The new nationalist identity of the 19th century in Europe was in part initially linked to the emergence of a middle class as a recognizable social category, coinciding with the growth of both capitalism and its counterpart, colonialism. Together with this came the demand for democratic and representative government. The question of identity became crucial to claiming the inheritance of power. It has been said that nationalism needed the concept of the nation much as the nation needed nationalism. There is a parallel situation to this among societies that have experienced colonialism, and this is where my focus will be. In the colonial reconstruction of history of its colony, existing interpretations of the past were set aside. New communities were created from the emergence of the middle class in each colony. Inevitably, such communities internalized the history that had been constructed for them by the colonial power. Creating an identity became crucial and history moved to center stage. 
Nationalism, frequently anti-colonial, was among the ideologies of the colonized, but they tended not to question this history constructed for them, at least not initially. I would like to illustrate my argument by recourse to events in India over the last two centuries. Colonial scholarship had come to terms with multiple and various uh, identities in the subcontinent. For example, with the differing patterns of caste stratification in different parts of the, of the, of the territory, and with the multiplicity of religious sects since Indian religions, unlike the European, were not monolithic. But colonial scholars, therefore, found it convenient to invent monolithic religious groups of which two were, were viewed as prominent. These became the protagonists of history that dominated colonial historical explanation as interpreted by colonial historians. The colonial understanding of the Indian past was intended to support colonial policy. Two defining theories were readily adopted. One came to be called the two-nation theory. It was argued by James Mill and utilitarian philosophers that India consisted of two nations, the Hindu and the Muslim, that had always invariably been mutually hostile. The coming of the colonial power, they said, ended the tyranny of Muslim rule over a largely Hindu population. The Hindus being the largest in number were the majority community, whereas others were minorities, of which the Muslim was the largest. The actual and the more extensive multiplicity of communities and of religious sects was ignored in this historical reconstruction. It was unfamiliar to the colonizers and it was irrelevant, above all, to colonial policy. The emerging Indian middle class accepted religion as the main identity of the communities. The coexistence of many religions subsequently became the definition of the Indian version of secularism. The other theory that took root from colonial scholarship was the theory of Aryan race. Colonial scholars and many, many Orientalists in Europe argued that the foundations of Indian civilization lay in the Aryan culture superior to all others as described in the Vedic texts and was therefore Hindu. Please note that this is happening in the latter half of the 19th century when similar ideas are being developed in Europe. Among its many proponents, the theory of the Aryan race, was Max Muller, who stated that the Aryans came to India from their homeland in Central Asia, and Colonel Olcott held that the Aryans did not come to India, but were indigenous to India and traveled west to civilize the world. But despite both these theories, it was interest in establishing a secular democracy that encouraged the larger and more effective nationalism, the secular anti-colonial nationalism. This has rightly been accorded the status of mainstream nationalism. This was the force that, mobilized, that was mobilized to liberate the colony from colonial rule and establish its independence. But the two colonial theories gave rise to subsidiary nationalisms in addition and in the 1920s. They grew at varying points of time to play a role that has become today central to contemporary politics in South Asia. These were movements rooted in religious extremism, going back to the colonial interest in religious communities, and are therefore called by various names, ranging from communalism, religious nationalism, to communal fascism, and even pseudo-nationalism. 
Those communal nationalisms, these communal nationalisms supported the two-nation theory and used religion as their identity. Their enemy was not the colonial power, but each other. Extremist nationalisms, when not anti-colonial, generally require an enemy within the nation. They were anxious to establish religion-based nation states. The Muslim League worked towards the creation of an Islamic state. It finally succeeded with the establishing of Pakistan in 1947. The Hindu Mahasabha, superseded by what is today called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, wishes to make India into a Hindu state. The justification sought for setting up two separate states was different in each case. Muslim communalism argued that in a single state, the Hindu majority would victimize the Muslim minority. Therefore, the Muslims needed a separate state. Hindu communalism argued that they were the indigenous peoples and the majority community basing themselves on the theory of Aryan origins and the Aryans being Hindu. The land was claimed as that of their ancestors and their religion. Muslims and Christians on both counts were foreigners since it was said that they came from outside India and their religion was also alien. This despite the fact that the population is about today 80% Hindu, but 20% um, is of Muslim, Christian, and other religions. Hindus, therefore, it was argued, had the right to be the primary citizens in a Hindu state. The ideology of these religious or communal nationalisms included the rights of only a single religious group, they legitimized their ideology by basing it on the colonial reconstruction of Indian history. What colonial scholarship failed to recognize was the link to caste. The distance between the upper castes and the lower castes was insurmountable, combining economic disparity with the notion of ritual pollution. This was common to all religions in India, including Islam and Christianity. Social confrontation was therefore more fierce than religious confrontation. And colonial scholarship, completely unfamiliar with caste disparities and what they meant socially, got the story completely wrong. But since their incorrect reading was foundational to the history they constructed, that history, however erroneous, found its way into the nationalisms based on religious identities. History was viewed as a millennium-long conflict between Hindus and Muslims. The utopias were either when the rulers were Hindu for the Hindu population and when the rulers were Muslims for the Muslim uh, religious population. After independence in 1947, it was assumed that since the secular anti-colonial nationalism had spearheaded the movement for independence, secular history would prevail. The primary identity of this nationalism was Indian. It was neither Hindu nor Muslim. It incorporated people of all religious castes and languages as equal. This was, in a sense, a new identity. But in present times, Hindu religious nationalism is carrying forward the colonial interpretation of Indian history. Such nationalisms, in order to succeed, have to silence not only the minorities, but also those that question the kind of supposed history that supports the establishing of religion-based states. Those of us that question these attempts are dismissed very readily as Marxist, irrespective of whether we are or not. And this 
for the religious nationalists becomes a word of abuse. Anybody they wish to attack, they say, oh, they're Marxists. Occasionally, the rather quaint word from the days of the Cold War, commie, is also used. These popular histories are being proclaimed now as indigenous histories. They are counterposed to academic history, that is, dismissed as being an imitation of what is written by Western historians. The irony is rich, since in their own kind of history, uh, their, their own kind of history is rooted actually in colonial readings, the readings that academic historians are currently questioning. Historians in India in recent times have had to defend their history from religious extremists and from the antipathy of such extremists to intellectual liberalism. I have focused on the Indian situation, but this is not confined to India as we know. It can be present and often is in other countries, especially ex-colonies. The question is, how do we protect the right to research and publish what we think is relevant? So far, at least in India, it is not an absolutely desperate situation. We can publish what we want to, despite the fact that occasionally our books are banned. And the demands are made for more and more banning of more and more books. And we just hope that publishers will have the courage to go on publishing them. But when the intervention takes the form of controlling what is to be taught, as is now beginning to happen, then the problem becomes more severe. As we know from much experience all over the world, the pattern is recognizable. It begins with specific changes in school textbooks. We have had to battle this at intervals over the last 40 years. The next step is a curriculum for graduate and postgraduate studies controlled by a central governmental authority and uniformly applicable to all universities. This step is under discussion. Many ex-colonial societies today are experiencing acute political and intellectual confrontations in the name of a variety of nationalisms. These emanate from an understanding of history as it was developed by colonial scholarship, but which is being challenged by post-colonial scholarship. When history gets enmeshed in politics via identity politics, then the historian has to differentiate between analytical history and narratives that fantasize the past. And we have to explain the difference between the two. The methodology of the study of history crosses borders with ease, but the construction of new methodologies and the application of these to particular histories can become problematic, where the authority concerned tries to control what is written. Differentiated religious and cultural forms exist in most societies. The differences coexist as entities, or get amalgamated, or confront each other, or create new forms. As historians, we also have to see the interstices of various patterns of living and explain how and why they change. This requires sensitivity to the spaces that they create and an observation of how they arrive at the identities that they construct. It also requires that such explanations should reach the public so as to make people better acquainted with the processes that go into their making. These are the issues, it seems to me, that confront the historian in the role of a public intellectual. In doing so, we have to unpack 
some of the baggage, we as historians have to unpack some of the baggage of history that has traveled with us over many centuries. Let me just try and give you three examples. Conflict situations today arise often from border disputes, especially where borders today are cartographically defined. In history, and I'm seeing it from the perspective of someone who's studying history way back many centuries ago. In history, this is a recent practice. Four centuries ago and earlier, there was no cartography supported borders and the disputes were of a different kind. Perhaps when we talk about border disputes today, we should go back in time and look at what was meant by borders before cartography determined the line that makes the border. A question of a different kind is that of political ideologies that uh, characterized kingdoms but did not create identities. This is a very major difference between pre-modern kingdoms and the states that we have today. Religion is mentioned. Religion was an important part of the old kingdoms, but it had two aspects, and these are aspects that, again, we must refer to repeatedly. Religious authorities in themselves were often creating conflicts. Let's not forget that uh, religion has both its positive and negative aspects. I'm talking about organized religion. Secondly, religious authorities were also confronting the state. And these are all areas of discussion, whether, it is, uh, whether we're talking about Christianity in Europe or Islam in the Middle East or Hinduism in India or Buddhism in India and China and so on. These are all aspects that need attention. It is not religion itself that historians have to explain to the public, but also the politics of religious institutions and organizations, both in the past and the present. And my third example is that for those of us who work on pre-modern history, we have already introduced the notion of history, at least without borders. I'm talking about concepts of civilization and the way those concepts are today being questioned by historians. In questioning the concept of civilization, what was referred to yesterday as these neat blocks that traverse the world, we have been challenging the frontiers, uh, the, sorry, we've been challenging the priorities of earlier historical writing. Civilizational blocks are being discarded, and within large areas, we are discovering porous points of extensive interconnectedness, sometimes across half the world. Taking Eurasia as the example, there is the Silk Route that cuts across the central parts of Eurasia, uh, cutting into these blocks, Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, Islamic civilization, the Mediterranean. Uh, now we also have the great uh, maritime route that goes from Africa to Egypt, to, to India, to Ceylon, to Southeast Asia, to China. Cutting into these civilizational blocks and making it quite clear that they were not uh, in any way isolated examples. They were very much interconnected without the borders that we like to link to them. Connections across Eurasia, both overland and by sea, reject the idea of well-defined civilizational blocks, characterized as we have been taught in school, uh, by a single language, a single religion, and clearly demarcated ter territory. This is becoming a very doubtful historical projection. In the making of a civilization, it is sometimes startling to discover that what we had earlier dismissed as the barbarian, the non-civilized, not us, them, that category turns out to be the catalyst in what we regard as being civilized. 
so that that relationship too between what is civilized and what is not is coming under question and discussion. This early globalization, which many of us refer to as globalization before globalization with a capital G, did not end history as Fukuyama would have maintained, but in fact moved it into a new phase. And that is what the historian would like to talk about, uh, how all this change in attitudes to civilization will now make us think of a new phase today. What do we then do with the grand narratives of nationalism and civilization? This will be our problem today. We historians, to conclude, we historians are sometimes left asking the question, whose history are we defending anyway? And today, this question becomes central in the minds of the historian, and particularly the historian who is also a public intellectual. Thank you. Thank you, and I have, uh, I mean, thank you first of all for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be in this wonderful hall and in this wonderful organization that is extremely relevant for public intellectuals, politicians and uh, academics, not only in history. We have uh, two of them joining us here in, the, in this uh, all-female panel which is also uh, not very useful to have an all-female panel in these conferences, but <laughs> hopefully so. Uh, so one of them um, is the rector of uh, University of Tampere, former dean of the, uh, of the faculty where I'm working, uh, Faculty of Social Sciences here at the University of Helsinki. She has been publishing on uh, failed states, diasporas, and working on African um, politics and development studies. Lisa Laakso, welcome. And the other one is uh, also uh, a colleague of mine, uh, even currently at the University of Helsinki at the same department, and uh, the leader of the project where I have been working on uh, asymmetries in European intellectual space has been funded by the Academy of Finland. Maria Jalava has been working on Nordic intellectual history, and she's also been working uh, on the politics of universities. So hopefully we can discuss these topics. Welcome all. Lisa, maybe you start. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your very inspiring uh, presentation. I think that uh, it uh, clearly proved that uh, one of the most important uh, role for intellectuals in society is to provide new concepts for the discussion. And uh, with these concepts, you can open up discussion on dominance and power in the society, and also you can, prove, uh, you can provide tools for the future. And I think that uh, historical understanding is, uh, is critical in, in both of these, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in both of these um, uh, questions. Um, concerning dominance, um, how identities are built, uh, like religion, for instance. Now, in the political use of uh, religion, it is actually not so much about uh, beliefs or worldviews, but it is about uh, marking of communities uh, who are to us and the others. And uh, this becomes 
the core content of the political discourse where uh, religion in a way is uh, clearly instrumentalized. Um, the question then on uh, writing of uh, history and traditions, and now I'm, I would like to refer to uh, historians working on, on Africa, for instance. For example, Nigerian scholar Peter Eke already in mid-70s uh, uh, introduced a discussion on the two publics, civic and primordial publics uh, with regard to the late colonial history and uh, independence struggle and how the power politics in the nationalist uh, movements uh, uh, reflected uh, different kind of discourses uh, and different kind of moralities, uh, both with, with regard to the uh, Western liberal uh, struggles and then the kind of uh, primordial kinship uh, uh, family building discourses with, um, with uh, concepts of, uh, of morality. And with this um, uh, conceptualization, Eke, for, for instance, uh, opened up a up, uh, whole, um, how do I say, um, new ways of analyzing African politics and uh, debating the, the nation building uh, uh, experiences in, in Africa. Finally, I think that, um, and, and related also to this um, uh, primordial publics, uh, a much uh, discussed debate uh, was conducted around the concepts of invention of tradition by uh, Terence Dranger and Eric Hobsbawm. And, and there too, I think that um, more important than the, than the theoretic theories and arguments themselves was this uh, concept and the debate on what is actually an authentic tradition, what is invented tradition, how they are written, how they are understood, and how ethnicity, ethnicities in particular in, in contemporary Africa were built. And these, these concepts were practically relevant in, in the analysis of uh, conflicts in, in countries like Zimbabwe, for instance, where Terence Ranger worked, and um, in the writing of the atrocities in Matabele and after independence in, in early 1980s. Um, finally, I think that this um, your reference to borders as, uh, as uh, recent concepts is, is also interesting because it reminds me of the fact that history is also an important tool for future. Borders and uh, nation building as we know it has and is reflecting certain kind of phases in, in modernity and in modern history. We do not know yet what the future looks like, but, uh, but if we think about mobility in contemporary societies and globalization, the roles of uh, diasporas, uh, circular um, uh, uh, circular mobility of people, I think that uh, borders themselves uh, can be questioned again. And uh, here I think that uh, historical knowledge can maybe provide um, 
understanding and instruments for us um, to think about political organization in, in a complex uh, world. Thank you, Lisa. Now we can continue this interdisciplinary discussion with a historian, Maria. So, in your very interesting presentation, you pointed out that the school textbook curriculum are an important, let's say, battlefield of different ideological and political and hegemonical projects. And that is indeed an extremely important dimension. Also in this very interesting book that you have recently published, you raise an important issue, and that is in order to be a public intellectual, an intellectual has to have a public. You have to have a public that is civilized, educated, open-minded enough to stand the situation where an intellectual challenges the most dearest, most intimate identifications, the ethnic, religious, gender-based, class-based, nationalist. And without this kind of, let's say, good enough public, an intellectual has a monologue. She or he cannot have a dialogue if there is no public who is willing to listen. And indeed, I must say that until recently in Finland, we have had a privileged situation because we have been able to enjoy the historians of a very good public. We have had an educated public that is interested in history. People are buying still even academic history books. They are reading them. They are arguing about history. They are watching documents from television. They are interested in the past in general. And indeed, I must now use this opportunity to express my deep worry about the cutting down of history education from the Finnish upper secondary schools. Not because I have a vested interest as an historian, because I became a historian in the first place since I think that history is such an important issue. So I must say that in the future, we, if we are opting out history from the school books, we are opening the floor to a wild fantasies, as you pointed out, different sort of fantastic narrative stories that don't have too much to do with the past, however you would like to think past to have been happened. We are not Rankians, of course, but still it doesn't have anything to do with so-called empirical documents and facts anymore. So that is perhaps an um, issue that I would like to emphasize. Let me paraphrase a German visual artist, Josef Beuys. He once said that everyone can be an artist. By this, he didn't mean that everybody should take a brush and start to do paintings. He meant that everybody can have a creative contribution to society. So I would like to now have a kind of utopian claim that everybody should be an intellectual, a public intellectual in the sense that everybody should be able to make a critical contribution to society. And that is why the basic elementary education in history is so important. Thank you very much. Romila, would you like to respond by any comments to this? Yeah, yes. Yes, I think um, Hello? No. Um, well, some very important points have been raised in, in the comments so far. Um, the, the, the question of new concepts, this is of course something that we're all terribly interested in. Uh, we keep discussing them and we keep debating them amongst ourselves. Uh, but it's also a case of 
making people understand that it is necessary to have new concepts, that the a way in which knowledge advances is not by just going on repeating the concepts that are already there. I mean, my contention with the, the, the school teaching, uh, the, the general curriculum in schools in India is precisely this, that they are institutions that give information to the child, but they never teach the child how to think. And the process of thinking is as important as the reliable information that is given. And the information is not, of course, always reliable, but that's another matter. Uh, but the process of thinking is absolutely essential because it is only by thinking that when students become adults and start moving into areas of knowledge, that they can question that knowledge and take it forward. And as we all know, whether we come from Europe or Asia or wherever, uh, knowledge advances. Knowledge cannot be static. Static knowledge is an absolute failure uh, of society. Therefore, the creation of new concepts is important. And I think that that is one area in which the public intellectual can play a very important part in, in discussing what these concepts should be. Um, we have certain concepts, for example, about religion. And we say, this is what religion means. And we don't question those concepts. And we don't say that the relationship of religion to society changes over history. You have one kind of relationship at one time, and you have another kind of relationship at another point in time. Um, and I mean, I'm talking about the social relationship, not the individual. The personal relationship is another matter altogether. But the institutional and organizational relationship is bound to change as society itself undergoes change. And it is necessary, therefore, for historians as public intellectuals to comment on this and to explain why the relationships are changing and explain what the change of meanings might be. Um, the, the question of the publics that, that one deals with, I think, is again extremely relevant and the invention of tradition. In fact, when the book first came out, it was an absolute eye-opener for most of us because the majority of people divide their uh, attitude into, this is traditional, um, this is present day. And what is traditional is seen as a kind of package which has been passed on from generation to generation unchanged. That's the kind of quality that is often given to the term, uh, this is traditional. But again, we have to realize that tradition itself is a historical process. It is, I mean, I'm obsessive about this, uh, not just because I'm a historian, but because I do see it that way. That tradition is a historical process in the sense that if you go back to, let's say, 1000 AD, and if you were in conversation with people living at that time who was knowledgeable about learning and so on, and discussed tradition with them, they would have a very different idea of what they meant by tradition to what we mean by tradition. And also, there's this historical difference. And the other thing is that there is a lot in tradition that is invented. That is, that is quite true. One sees this, for example, in uh, custom and ritual, uh, much of ritual. And I'm not talking about religious ritual. I mean, things like um, Independence Day parades, which are very, very common and popular in a lot of our countries. How did we put them together? We didn't suddenly invent them on the day that we got our independence. I mean, I'm talking about ex-colonies. We turned around and said, well, you know, how did the Europeans do it? How did the colonists do it? And we chose uh, who was to take the salute and who was to march and where the armored cars were to go and where the planes were to fly and so on. This is all invented. And after 50 years of doing this, year after year after year, people start talking about it as a tradition. So if you're a historian, your first reaction is, where did it all begin? And second, how did it begin? How do you explain the invention of particular traditions? They all have a social need. They all have a psychological need. 
uh, they are products of particular points in history. And one has to, again, look at the context and analyze the context of what is being invented and why it is being uh, invented. Um, and this relates very much to uh, a problem that, that again, uh, we are facing, certainly ex-colonies. What is heritage? We have immense debates on this. Is it simply something that existed in the past? Or is it something, what do we select from the past? After all, we're not repeating the whole of the past, we're selecting. And each generation is picking out from the past or what it imagines is the past, what suits it. And so that process of selection that goes into the making of a heritage is absolutely fundamental and has to be understood. And this is one area in which the, public the, the historian as a public intellectual has to play a very important role in explaining why particular items are being selected as part of the heritage. And the heritage will, of course, change as society changes. What we today regard as heritage will be, to some extent, different 100 years from now when other factors have come in, when other aspects of her heritage have also been revealed. I mean, this is where archaeology plays a very important part in heritage as well. Uh, what are we discovering about our past, and how does that relate to what we already know? Um, the definition of the public, yes, this is extremely important, and I'm in total sympathy uh, with those who object to uh, the marginalization of history or, in fact, the removal of history, as is happening in some cases. In our case, it is uh, both the, marginali the marginalization of reliable history and the replacement of reliable history by fantasy. That is the problem that we are facing, and it is a problem that is very, very central. It's very central because, and I will stop here now, because I think that in many ways, a total history, an all-rounded history, not just the political and diplomatic history or um, you know, any particular specialized history, but the totality of seeing a society through time is actually the biography of that society. And I think that in the same way as when you meet people, you want to know what their bi biography is. You want to slot them, index them, put them in a place where you can relate to them and understand them. The same way we read histories in order to understand the biography of a society. And therefore, the whole question of defining the public and getting into a dialogue with the public is extremely important. Very problematic, because how do you get into a dialogue with a public? Thanks. This was really interesting, and I have one question in, in my mind, because, well, um, I have been studying Hungarian politics, and, and there especially this kind of uh, re-emergence of writing of history, uh, and also generating publics that are actually interested in history, not because they necessarily studied it at school, where school books are being rewritten, um, but also, also because it gives them some identity. Um, it offers these points of identification and, and also points of contestation. So what do you do as a public intellectual uh, in a situation where this history uh, has become very fragmented or subcultural even, or polarized so that there's only two versions of the truth. Have you got any advice as a wise <laughs> woman or, or the panelists? Well, I, I think that this is, uh, this is really where the historian is extremely central in the role that the historian can play. Uh, which is not just even where history has got fragmented, but where history is being used for purposes other than the advancement of knowledge. Now, I'm not talking about knowledge advancing in a kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a capsule which nobody can touch or feel or anything. No, knowledge is not like that. Knowledge is something that you handle and that you, uh, you have a relationship with and so on. Um, 
it's, it's extremely important that the historian also realizes what the public debate is about. Very often, historians don't. Very often, historians think uh, we can go on living in our ivory towers. We can be esoteric. We don't have to enter the debate. Uh, a number of historians you meet, very good historians, who sort of say, I'm out of that debate. That is something that's going on in the public sphere. But a historian is never out of that debate, because whatever theory you throw up, and presumably, if you're a good historian, you are throwing up new concepts and new theories. Otherwise, you wouldn't be regarded as a good historian. Um, whatever new ideas you throw up, they have an immediate impact on the person who's listening to them or reading them. They have an impact on the public. And this is where I keep coming back to the point that you, you have to not only instruct the public in what you're doing, but you also have to explain why you're doing it, why it's important, not only to you, but why it is important to the public person as well. Therefore, the intervention of the historian is extremely important. We have been suffering from this as historians in India for the last 40, 50 years, because we have been, some of us at least, have been intervening every time we have thought that um, unreliable, fraudulent history is being written or taught or so on, we tend to immediately move in and say, this is why we think it is fraudulent. This is why we think it is fantasy and not history. But that consciousness and awareness that the historian has a responsibility to society is something that I would underline very strongly. Uh, I could continue from that. I, I think that uh, what uh, historians, as, as all scientists, need uh, is also uh, uh, dissemination of the results to the public, which means media and uh, publishers and the um, scholarly community also out, outside of the borders in other countries, the, the international community. There might be situations where, where there, are, uh, there is power politics or power holders who, who uh, do not uh, accept certain kind of science and certain kind of writings. But uh, then you need, and then we need the international, uh, international intellectual community to support these scholars and uh, I would like to say here that in, in the contemporary world, we have a lot of scholars at risk. And this is one of the networks that has been created recently. Uh, and it is uh, our responsibility to provide support uh, to, uh, to scientists uh, who, who are threatened because uh, of their uh, work and because of their opinions. Thanks. Is there any questions from the public? Are there any questions? Oh, there. Yes. I didn't see any hands yet, but can we get her mic at the back? Thank you. Um, Lisa Laxlo mentioned about creating new concepts, which I agree, and uh, you also underlined the importance of it. Is it that on? Keep you it can a bit hear. closer. Okay. So. Um, I also would like to bring the importance of revisiting the old concepts, which is as important as inventing new concepts. And uh, when I think of uh, rethinking the old concepts, one of the things Romila Tapar briefly mentioned in her lecture, but didn't dwell too much on it, is the issue of nationalism. Uh, the importance of nationalism, quote unquote, in independence uh, struggles and so on and so forth. We today in social sciences seem to be too quickly rushing and uh, dismissing the importance of nationalism 
on the grounds that nationalism is archaic, it is um, attachment to primordial roots and so on and so forth. I think, I would like to hear your thoughts about nationalism. I, I think we are too quick in dismissing it. Uh, this is, this, by doing so, we are repeating the discourse of globalism, which is the discourse of capital, basically. Capital doesn't want nation states. Capital doesn't want borders. It wants the free movement. So when we are despising nationalism, uh, we are forgetting that nation state is the agent for many subaltern populations, for many people who are excluded uh, from uh, basic rights of citizenship. They have to wage their struggle through the nation state. They have to make their claims to the nation state. So how about inventing notions like popular nationalism, people's nationalism, or subaltern nationalism, and so on and so forth, rather than quickly dismissing it uh, Thank you. Thanks, that's an interesting question. Do you want to have a quick response to that? We have to be end, finishing really quickly because yeah. the next no, starts. No, I, I would agree that um, I don't think there are many, many states in which you cannot dismiss nationalism in a hurry. It's still very much there. there. And in a sense, what I was talking about, uh, the clash between a kind of secular nationalism and a religious nationalism that we are facing today in India. Uh, this is one in which one dare not say that I'm not going to talk about nationalism. You have to. And if you feel that the religious nationalism is not what you uh, uh, subscribe to, you have to explain exactly why you are not subscribing to it. Which is why, you know, people like us who previously had nothing to do with nationalist history are now reading it and writing about it and talking about it because it has become an essential part of how uh, other people are reading our kind of ancient history even. I mean, nationalism has a very big take on ancient roots and ancient origins and that kind of thing. Uh, so it is important, but at the same time, I think it is... Uh, equally necessary for historians to explain that there were old concepts which have to be revisited and explained uh, as to how they arose, why they arose, why they still have validity. That is equally important. But at the same time, to explain that we have new concepts now. I mean, we, we do have a history of India written by nationalist historians and the 40s and the 50s and so on, around the time of independence. And we do try and explain why they take certain positions. But at the same time, when history changed from being Indology to becoming a social science in the 1960s and onwards, we also have to explain to the public that we are using new concepts. And these new concepts are different from the old. Uh, explain the difference, and where we think they are more appropriate, explain why they are more appropriate. So it's, it's a problem of uh, not just saying that, you know, um, the old one has to be explained and up to a point continued, but also that it is being replaced by new concepts and is the replacement legitimate or not. That, I think, is a very fundamental issue. On globalization, um, there is a crisis in some of our countries because it's not just nation states and the relationship between nation states, but it's what globalization is doing within that nation state. What is globalization doing to a, a nation, a, a state like, like India, for example, where the crying need today is employment? And you suddenly have a situation with economic globalization which is sort of standing in the way of creating new jobs locally. And this is becoming a very major issue. It's becoming a really important issue as far as, as the politics of the middle class are concerned. Um, so it's, it's a multifaceted thing, globalization. And one really has to look at all these different facets and then decide uh, where one says it's a good thing or a bad thing. Great, thank you very much. We have to stop this all-female panel before it takes over the 
whole last session. Thanks <laughs> very much and let the males take over. <laughs> Thank you.